creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... <laughs> The Extraordinary. The Extraordinary is the phenomenal story of Eddie Robinson, a man who, ten years after losing his sight and hearing, was suddenly given them back. Struck by lightning, Eddie could see and hear again. It is the night this young man walked a lonely tropical beach toward a circle of strangers and heard the most intimate secrets of his dead father through a woman he'd never met. I'm a skeptic. I've never ever seen anything so real. It is the chilling story of Maurice Therio and this terrifying home video of the possessed man's face disintegrating during a rite of exorcism. And the only thing that I could say when he did it was amen. I'll come out. The Extraordinary is the final moment in the life of actor Gary Cooper. His dogs howled as he passed from Earth at precisely high noon. Just some of the stories beyond our normal understanding tonight on The Extraordinary. Good evening, I'm Warwick Moss. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It's a line we use, or hear now and then, probably without much true appreciation of its meaning. But not Eddie Robinson. Eddie knows how fickle the gift of life, how tenuous the very senses of hearing and sight we take for granted. In Eddie's case, the Lord took away. And then in a dramatic, brilliant flash of light from the heavens, the Lord gave back. It was the most silent of nights. The huge tires of the semi-trailer moved softly over fresh fallen snow along a lonely highway near Providence, Rhode Island. It was about 4 a.m. on February 12, 1971. And something was about to happen that would change the life of the man behind the wheel. He drove cautiously. Eddie Robinson always drove cautiously. He was 53, and he had spent 18 years behind the wheel of big rigs like this. As he eased onto the Interstate Freeway 195, he could see the ice ahead glistening in oncoming headlights, and he throttled back. St. Valentine's Day was only 48 hours away, and Doris was waiting at home. This night, 22 years ago, is vivid in his memory today. Eddie is 75 now. He no longer drives the big rigs. He helps people load their groceries at a local supermarket in his hometown of Falmouth in the state of Maine. He tells them to drive carefully in the snow and he tells them to believe in miracles. He knows. The scene for Ed Robinson's personal miracle was set on this night on the 195 in Rhode Island a brush with death that would devastate him for 10 years. Then another brush with death that would shine all the brightness of heaven onto the remainder of his life on earth. In a blinding, deafening tragedy, Ed Robinson could not have known, but he was about to become one of God's chosen. A car ahead of him spun out on the icy road and went out of control. He was in, in my lane, so I cut the wheel to miss him. Ed swerved his rig to the right, managed to miss the car, swung back. I knew he bumped the trailer, but he never stopped. On the ice, the momentum of his trailer took over. 
In his side view mirror, he saw the beginning of the semi-driver's worst nightmare, jackknife. I won't want to go through it again. It's just once enough. When the snow cloud settled and Ed struggled back to consciousness, his head and neck were soaked with blood. I had a lump on the back of my neck, in the back, way back here, bad spot. The smell of diesel fuel filled the cabin. He could barely move his right arm. Worse was the view through his windscreen. He was looking straight down, a drop of 40 feet to another highway below the bridge. My first thought was to jump, and clear the pavement, and then uh, shoulder the road down below me. His trailer had hooked on the guardrail, but his whole cabin was dangling over the bridge, hanging only by the link pin. To this day, he doesn't know how he climbed out and back up to the bridge roadway that night. He considered it a minor miracle that he was alive, that he had made it through. But the miracle of Ed Robinson's life had only just begun. The car he swerved to miss that night kept going, but another motorist called an ambulance. And at the hospital, doctors could find only minor injuries. They were wrong. But Ed thinks it was probably his fault. He was never one to complain about pain. He caught a bus all the way back home to Falmouth, Maine the next morning. I got home, I had a lot of problems. I can't remember them. My wife knows them, but it, it, you know, because she put up, put up with it. At the base of my brain, I got a bad bang. The extent of Ed Robinson's injuries and the depth of this tragedy would take three months to surface. Gradually, his eyesight worsened. Then his hearing rapidly began to go. His vision had been reduced to recognition of only dark or light. He was totally blind. His doctor, William F. Taylor. We totally lost his sight. By losing his sight, I mean, he could see, still see uh, light and dark, but he couldn't spot anything at all. By the end of that month, Eddie was also almost totally deaf, able to barely hear his beloved Doris, and then only with a powerful hearing aid. It is under such conditions that the true measure of people is often found. And for 10 dark, silent years, the simple strength of Ed Robinson and his wife became legend in Falmouth. You're never going to see it again. Doctors said that. Yeah. So forget about it, you know. So, um, but uh, the nurse had to live with it. We just lived it, you know. You don't think. You just live it, whatever happens. Their simple resolve to accept the cards life dealt them showed in everything it attempted, in every support Doris provided. He learned to read Braille. Within months, he was repairing lawnmowers for neighbors by touch. He could take it right apart, the whole lawnmower on the floor in the dark. Yeah, I couldn't figure that out. It was strange. How you doing? He also operated a ham radio, worked on the lawnmowers and kept busy. He became known as the blind man who had figured out a way to mow his own lawn, day or night. It didn't matter. I drove a stake in the middle of the lawn, and I put a rope on it, and put a rope on the lawnmower, and uh, go with it till I unwound it. And Eddie became known for something else. They called him the Animal Man. After a lifetime of 70-hour work weeks, he came to appreciate simple things. He came to treasure all forms of life. He fed raccoons. He adopted a visiting skunk. And for 10 years, he raised and formed his most special bond with a chicken that lost its toes to frostbite. And a truck overturned with chickens in it going to market. And she come up over the bank and came over here. And she didn't go to market. She lived here, what, 11 years? Yeah, she was sweet. Sweet little chicken. We took her in the house and let her watch television. And he loved her, yeah. Do you have any favorite shows, like Green Eighty? <laughs> I don't know. She watched what I had on. <laughs> you would say that. 
she would talk, talk, talk the whole time, all the time. She used to tag right along with me, following me all around the place. They called her Tuk Tuk, and Eddie and his bantam hen spent many hours together. He even built a covered passageway from the backyard to the workshed so Tuk Tuk could come and go on cold nights. Tuk Tuk is important because it was this chicken that would lead Ed Robinson into the path of a bolt of lightning. When I got struck by lightning, uh, I was looking for her. And somewhere in that lightning bolt's million volts of power was Ed Robinson's miracle. He was pottering in his shed on the afternoon of June 4, 1980. It was about 3.30 when heavy summer rain started to pelt down on the roof and thunder pounded in a darkening sky. Doris was asleep inside and Eddie called for his friend, Tuk Tuk. He couldn't feel her, so he called her name as he walked from the shed. And then... In a flash, his ears exploded with the sound of an immense snap. No thunder. I never heard no thunder. I heard a crack, snap like a whip. And right in there is where I got zapped. The lightning electrified the wet earth, and Ed was flattened, unconscious in the mud. When he came to 20 minutes later, he was dazed and hurt. Staggering, he felt his way back into the house, where Doris had somehow slept through it all. He made his way to the bedroom and passed out. For about three hours, he slept. All he remembers now is that he next heard Doris's voice calling. She always called him when dinner was ready. She called me, and I stood up my rubber legs I had, just like rubber. So I told her, I said, you know, I said, I think I get struck by lightning. Doris helped him to a couch. As he sat there, still dazed and unfocused, she sat in a chair opposite him, and they talked for several moments. All at once she said, where's your hearing aids? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> They're not here. <laughs> the hearing aids would be found later, burned by the lightning and melted in the mud. But in this moment, Eddie realised he had been hearing Doris clearly for the first time in ten years. In the next moment, as his day's mind became clearer, Ed Robinson realised something else. To this day, he will gladly reconstruct the moment of his personal miracle as his eyes came into focus. Doris, do you know what? I can see that plaque on the wall, and then I can read that plaque. God can't be everywhere, so he made grandfathers. The plaque had been a gift from his grandchildren, grandchildren he had never seen. The sight of his married son, he had not seen since high school, would come too. So would full movement of eyes that had been rigidly fixed for 10 years. I've never heard of anything like this at all. And it happened within minutes. He totally got his vision back. He was able to see everything and function normally as far as his eyesight's concerned. It's a miracle, you know, it's a, how, how that happened. It, Meant to be, I guess, you know. The doctors may be great, but there's somebody a lot greater. Experiences of life may invade our sleep for a time. Nightmares follow tragedy and emotional trauma until the wounds heal and gradually fade so that we can get on with the rest of our lives. When bad memories recur, we try to shut them out, and often we can. But then comes a day when all the willpower in the world cannot stop the nightmare coming back. It came back to Colin Brooks one afternoon, while he was walking on a lonely beach in far north Queensland. Even as they started their walk, it was no ordinary evening for Colin. Despite an outwardly happy appearance, he was heavy with thought about a family tragedy six years earlier. 
an event he would not share with his girlfriend. In fact, he had told no one. For some reason, images of that tragedy had begun to vividly return. It hadn't been this bad for a long time. Colin was used to keeping the pain and guilt to himself. He'd moved north from Melbourne, merged into the local tropical lifestyle, played first division football, became pretty successful finding work around town. Life seemed to be getting back on track. Time was making amends for the tragedy. But all that day, those images had somehow come back. As Colin walked along the beach, he looked ahead and saw the faint outline of a group of people gathered around a fire. He didn't take much notice, those other thoughts playing on his mind. Yet Colin had learned to cover his pain well. He seemed as happy-go-lucky as anyone his age should be. As they drew closer, Colin began to realise there was something unusual about the people on the beach. They sat in absolute silence. The only sound was the crackle of the fire against the rumble of the surf. He'd never seen any of them before, but, but that was not unusual in the tourist heart of Queensland. In darkness, those distant images grew clearer in Colin's mind. Colin Brooks' father had killed himself in the family garage, and nothing would make that sad fact go away. I'd never been able to speak about my father and my childhood to anyone. Just after dusk, on a barren beach on Magnetic Island off Townsville, life changed for Colin in the most dramatic and unexpected of ways. As they approached the group, sitting in a circle on the beach, Colin was to get his first real hint of something strange. Hello, Colin. We've been expecting you. Colin had never met these people, yet they knew his name, seemed to be waiting specifically for him. All of a sudden, it spoke to me. It spoke to me in a way that um, I couldn't describe. It's, it's just things that it, it, knew, it knew me, or she knew me very well. Always remember, son, to take responsibility for your own life. He didn't know it then, but Colin was about to hear the most intimate thoughts and words of his late father through the mouth of one of the women in the circle. Your mother and I may have grown apart over the years, but I've always loved her too. The voice changed. The face changed. I realised then what was being conveyed to me was my father. Sometimes life gets just a bit too much and you can't cope. So I hope you don't hurt me for that. I've made mistakes. She spoke in detail of his childhood, a childhood he had revealed to no one. I just want you to understand that I'm sorry for what happened. And I love you very much. She spoke of private and personal hopes. What I want you to do is move on. You must move on in life. Do it for me and for yourself. She spoke in phrases exactly the same as Colin's father used to use. Mm -hmm. My father used to say to me, um, he used to always call me a whinger as a kid. And, um, it was those exact words. It was, stop whinging and get on with your life. There's no point in whinging, son. You have to get on with your life. She apologised. She spoke of love. I've, I've always, always loved, loved you. you. Maybe, Maybe I, I didn't show it. But I've always loved, loved you. And I always will. will. I, I want you to tell Mum and all the family that I'm sorry. And I love you all very much. It 
It got into parts of my life that um, nobody could ever know. Channeling. Spirits in a past life using spirits in this life as a conduit to make peace with loved ones. Possible? It's so now up to you to look after mother and family. Was Colin's father making contact six years after his death? I expressed love for my mother, my f for my mother and the rest of my family, and it especially wanted me to, to um, convey to them that things were all right and um, things were better this way. Soon after, Colin left Magnetic Island. He never saw those people again. He doesn't know who they were, where they came from, or how his path came to cross theirs. For me, I'm a skeptic, and um, I've never ever seen anything so real. You may not speak to me again, but I'll always be there for you. The only witness to Colin's story was the girl who was with him that night, a local girl. He's long since forgotten about her, but the events of that night are as vivid as if they were yesterday. The dramatic story of Maurice Theriot, a man possessed and the terrifying home video of a private exorcism that went horribly wrong. He aimed a gun at her, but suddenly the good part of Maurice somehow overtook him. He looked at her, he put the gun in his mouth and killed himself. He could have killed her right there, but he didn't. When actor Gary Cooper died, press from around the world were there. They heard his dogs howling at precisely high noon, the moment Cooper passed from this earth. A dog always knows when the master's soul leaves the earth. It happened on an average country road, in an average house. The neighbours were aware that something was wrong with the Ferio family. The children were normal. The wife was friendly, yet constantly troubled. And the husband, Maurice. The rumour was Maurice was possessed. Raphael Abramovitz visited the Therio house a few weeks after all hell broke loose. Indeed, if you believe in demonic possession, that the devil can dwell in the soul of man and control his actions, then it was hell that broke loose here. For Nancy, wife of the possessed Maurice Thirio, it was eight years of hell that finally exploded in a night of such evil and violence that the small farming community of Watley, Massachusetts may never fully recover. It is the story of an exorcism ritual that either failed or tragically backfired. Nancy Thirio may never recover either, but she has found peace. He says, you're going to remember this. It's like he's fighting with somebody. He's going to put the gun in his mouth. He's not going to put the gun in his mouth. And I just sat there. Finally, he got the gun in his mouth. He pulled the trigger. His head goes back. His head goes up. His body goes back. And the only thing that I could say when he did it was amen. He aimed the gun at her. But suddenly, the good part of Maurice somehow overtook him. He looked at her. He put the gun in his mouth and killed himself. He could have killed her right there, but he didn't. So I see where good had taken over evil. It may be difficult to believe that the newly widowed Nancy and her friend Ed Warren are talking about this man. <laughs> the gentle, happy grandfather born to French-Canadian parents 51 years earlier in Maine. 
He quietly grew vegetables on his small property and in his greenhouse, and he sold them at a roadside stand in Watley. Most of the time, he was the good neighbor, affectionately known to the locals as Frenchie. But Frenchie was two people, at home with Nancy and her children from an earlier marriage, or his own children, Frenchie could turn evil without warning. Oh, you're scary. I had many scary moments. What do you mean? There was, uh... There was times when he got mean and he got that look on his face that he would go after my daughters or hit them or smack them. But most of it was done behind my back. You're getting upset. What's upsetting you now? Do you want us to stop for a while? No. What happened to my children? What they went through during this. What we all went through. Well, Maurice Theriot's capacity for instant violence was terrifying for all those around him, it was the source of his violence that brought Ed and Lorraine Warren into the house. He was possessed by a demonic spirit, maybe even more than one demonic spirit. The Warrens, who spent years recording and assisting at exorcisms, were called in by a Catholic priest after Nancy Theriot went for help in controlling Maurice's behavior. Such as what? Movement of objects, sounds, uh, bleeding from Maurice's eyes or from no natural causes, uh, crosses appearing on his body. State police were called in, local police. They found Maurice on the floor in the, in the uh, bathroom. And while there, they had seen phenomena occurring around Maurice, the bleeding from the mouth, the eyes, um, French-Canadian messages appearing on his back. If the police and the Warrens were alarmed by the unexplained phenomena around Therio, Nancy could describe years of terrifying events she had been too scared to report. And all of a sudden, I turned around and I saw this whoosh go by, and it was a two-by-four, flew across the greenhouse, hit him in the head, and knocked him down. Nancy Therio talks of witnessing endless strange happenings, and in between the apparent supernatural events, there was always the violence of Maurice. Threatening, beating, spitting, constant promises of suicide or murder. Why didn't you pick up and leave? Because there was too many threats. And we threatened that if we did go, that... And we never even told the Warrens this. I thought that anything was ever said, or if the kids ever talked about anything that... The children was going to try to, my children were going to try to break us up and he'd kill one of them or something would happen to one of them. Finally, a decision was made. Bishop Robert McKenna, a friend of the priest who brought the Warrens to the case of Maurice Therio, decided a full solemn exorcism was the only chance to avoid a tragedy. This is called the ritual Romano, which is the ultimate in the rites of exorcism where Catholicism is concerned. He prepared himself. Uh, he went to the home. And the exorcism would be the first ever recorded on videotape. A tape that shows Maurice's face changing from this to this as the bishop chanted to cast out the devil. Nancy Theria was present throughout the exorcism. When they were doing the, the exorcism on him, when he turned his head, I saw his face change. I saw the satanic look on his face. As the video shows, far more was about to change on Therio's face than its expression. As Bishop McKenna chants, Therio's skin seems to bubble. A deep crack has opened on his forehead. Maurice, you feel anything inside you? I see characteristics of his face look like they're becoming all crinkled, like burnt. There's a split on the left side of the head, which widens, opens up. Um, the eyes, he blinks three times, which we consider an insult to the Trinity. The eyes look like a serpent. How many are you? All of a sudden, his eyes rolled up in his head, and he, his head went down. 
He collapsed, and within a few minutes, he came to. The first thing he asked for was Nancy, his wife. This exorcism took place on the day after Easter 1985, and for several years, Maurice Theriot seemed to become normal again. Things seemed to be going good. In fact, he wasn't even as mean as he used to be. He was, he was easy going. He was easy going and everything. But about a year ago, Ed Warren received an ominous call from Nancy Theriot. And she said, uh, Ed, I have to speak with you. And she said, uh, Maurice is going back into his old ways again. The blood is coming out of his eyes. Uh, he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing. Uh, he's threatening people. It was the beginning of the final tragic possession of Maurice. In a few months, he would be dead. We'll continue in a moment with the exorcism of Maurice Theriot. An exorcism that went horribly wrong. <laughs> and months after Maurice Theriot underwent his torturous exorcism by the so-called New Age Catholic Bishop McKenna, he seemed to be free of whatever demons possessed him. But soon, signs of evil began to surface once again, leading to a chilling final chapter. Raphael Abramovitz continues the exorcism of Maurice Theriot. Over and over again, the bishop said these words. Evil spirit, tell me your name in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Blessed Virgin. How did you enter Maurice? For many years, Maurice Theria was accused by some of using trickery to fake his spontaneous bleeding and other physical phenomena. But in the exorcism conducted by Bishop McKenna, the camera captured images that nobody has been able to explain. As his skin bubbled and a crack appeared on his left temple and his eyes took on the satanic gaze of a madman, at least a dozen people were present to witness it. When it was over, his skin was clear. Maurice seemed like his former self and his wife's nightmare subsided for a time. That horrifying look on his face disappears. Mm -hmm. And he's back to being yeah. the Morris you know, right? But the nice one. Right. But last year, without warning, the demon seemed to take over Maurice in a hideous final possession that would explode in bloodshed. Through the afternoon, hiding in the basement, he lay in wait for his wife to come home. He burst through the kitchen door with a shotgun. He started to come toward me with a gun, and I grabbed or had my hands on the gun with him, fighting with him. He swung and he hit me with the butt of the gun. I don't know what gave me the strength to keep going, the adrenaline or what it was. In fear, Nancy ran from the house to beg for help from neighbors. The shotgun fired and tore off her arm. And when I got as far as the road, I heard a bang and a crash. And they told me that he had shot through the window in the living room. Maurice ran into the street and dragged her back inside made her sit down and set about putting her through her final torture. He made her watch him take his own life. He says, you're going to remember this. And he sits down on the other sofa in front of me, which was about, I'd say, about five feet away, trying to put the gun in his mouth. And he's going this way with the gun. It's, it's like he's fighting with somebody. Finally, he got the gun in his mouth. He pulled the trigger. His head goes back. His head goes up. His body goes back. And the only thing that I could say when he did it was amen. That's the only thing I said, amen. That's the only word that would come out of my mouth. And the only other word that I said when he was pounding on me is I said, oh God, oh God. And he kept pounding me in the head and I can remember him saying, yes, oh God. And that, those are the only words I said after I had the scuffle with him after he hit me. I was, oh God. And then when he shot himself, I said, amen. I ran up the road and I'm screaming and yelling for help. I get up to the, the house on the right and I go to the house and I'm screaming and yelling, help me, help me, help me. When I looked up, I saw my landlord, which lived in the house further up from me. He was there and said, Nancy, keep talking, Nancy, keep talking. And I started talking about the grandchildren. I was saying my prayers. The small Theriot house on the rural country road is quiet again. 
Life has returned to normal in the farming community of Watley, Massachusetts. Do you ever uh, dream about him? I haven't had one dream about that man since this happened. I'm sorry that he had to die. I mean, I didn't want him to die. All I wanted to do was leave me alone. But I'm glad he's gone. I'm glad he's gone. Mrs. Theria has now found peace in this life. <laughs> Time Hollywood observer and columnist James Bacon rubbed shoulders with all the stars of the golden era. Sinatra, Brando, Cary Grant. Each one had his own sense of the higher being. Some of them, an experience with the unexplained. But the mystery that haunts Bacon happened on the day actor Gary Cooper died, at high noon. His final hour was here, in the house he shared for 20 years with his wife, daughter, and three dogs. Their neighbors were Judy Garland, Bing Crosby, Bogey, and Bacall. And if you pass beyond the gate of any driveway in Holmby Hills, a one-of-a-kind story awaited you. This is Gary Cooper's. Hello, friends and neighbors of Australia. We'd like to say that it feels mighty good to have our feet on solid ground after 7,000 miles of Pacific Ocean rolling under you. Australia met him in person in the 1940s. We knew him as the heroic Sergeant York and as common man John Doe. But most of all, like the rest of the world, we knew him best as the immortalized sheriff, Will Kane, who faced his greatest fear and endured in the classic western of all time, High Noon. I'll come out, let her go. Forty years ago, Hollywood columnist James Bacon sat in Cooper's living room. I came here in 1952 after that first sneak preview of High Noon, which was a disaster. And Cooper sat there on the couch, and his two French poodles jumped up on his lap and, you know, got very licking him and everything else. Gary Cooper's closeness to his dogs was special, as we'll see in a moment. But his conversation with James Bacon that day wasn't about the dogs. Cooper was distressed. The first cut of High Noon was a disaster. The director had a thing for Grace Kelly, and he was so intent on her close-ups, he lost the plot. The whole picture had to be re-edited, and the song High Noon was actually written so audiences could understand the storyline. Elmo Williams took the picture for that weekend, and he cut it down to its bare high noon terror. And all during the picture, Cooper had an ulcer. And when we saw the sneak preview, he was burping all over the place. Well, Elmo took that burp and cut it in such a way it looked like a guy who was scared to death he was going to be killed, which Cooper was, you know, with these desperados coming after him. Cooper that year won the Oscar for the best actor for High Noon. And I happened to be in the press room the night he came off stage and he came up to me and he says, it's the first time an ulcer has ever won an Oscar. The world always thought of Gary Cooper as the cowboy who could only say, yup or nup, but he was, in fact, a man of great style and sophistication. They were good years here with Rocky and his daughter Maria. The Cooper house has new owners now, but back then it welcomed the likes of Ernest Hemingway, Clark Gable and Jimmy Stewart. When Gary Cooper died in 1961 of cancer, just six days after his 60th birthday, all Hollywood turned out for his funeral. The motion picture world has said its farewell to its most beloved star. But it was an eerie moment shortly before this ceremony 
that still haunts James Bacon today. Now, the last time I was at this house, I was not inside. I was out in front. It was a death watch for Gary Cooper. So a whole small army of reporters and photographers and uh, radio people outside just waiting, and it was uh, very, very sad. And all of a sudden, his three dogs came out to the side of the house. There were two French poodles and a mongrel. And they started howling, whining, and making the weirdest sounds. You know. It was, you know, like a group of banshees you know, howling to the moon. James Bacon didn't know it, but it was a scene that would stay with him for the rest of his life. Well, I looked at my watch, and it was 12.27. I noticed that, and I made a mental note. Then I went back with the other reporters. No one else followed me over to the dogs, as I recall. I remembered at the time, my mother told me an old Irish folk tale. A dog always knows when the master's soul leaves the earth. It must have been one o'clock, the, the doctor come out and says, Mr. Cooper has died. And I said, what was the precise time of death? He says, 1227 right on the nose. So there it was, that Irish folk tale. The dogs howled. Cooper died. High noon. Man, to create a master race, a whole generation of super children bred from the best human stock. Now, you never wanted to be just a fireman or a policeman or... No, that's too normal a job for me. I mean, if somebody with such a strong capability should be, sh should be something a lot more than that, can, that, 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 that can really help the world because they have the, the ability to, to do so. It's not a throwback to Europe in the 1940s. It's happening today in the USA, an untold story, next week. That's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, I'd like to show you something from next week's show. It's a hidden story behind Australia's first major air disaster, told by longtime media personality, Keith Smith. The Southern Cloud, with six passengers and a crew of two, took off from Sydney on March 21, 1931. It flew south, meeting 100 mile an hour headwinds, and was never seen again. Now, we should remember that Keith Smith was no devout believer in the hereafter, nor a regular seance goer. He was at this psychic gathering as an objective, perhaps skeptical, investigative journalist. The medium went into trance, first of all, and as they sang, to my astonishment, the trumpet slowly floated off the floor in the darkness, covered in paint, remember, up to the ceiling. A small voice came out of it. It said, And then, like a small bill in my mind, I remembered. And he said, Southern Cloud. The voice said, yes, yes. I said, where did you all end up?